Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. We want to welcome everyone who's joining us on, online right now. Welcome to Converge Church. We're, we're grateful that, that you are here. Uh, a few announcements before we go into a time of prayer, so let's see what we got up here. Um, it says we've raised $7,800. Actually, we've met our goal, so praise the Lord for that. So let's, yep, let's clap for that. All glory goes to God, and, but we're going to continue to take donations, so if you want to continue to do that or do so for the first time, we'd welcome that. Uh, you can go to the Converge Church website, go to online giving, you see options for general giving, benevolence fund, and Ukraine fund. So uh, online giving is a, a, a good option there, or you could just write a check and say uh, Ukraine initiative or Ukraine fund on there, and we'll make sure it gets there. Um, thank you, thank you very much for that. What do we got next? Family fun night, uh, first one this Friday at 6 o'clock, right outside, and guess what? This one will come with cake. Yes, there will be cake at this one because it's also Peter Friesen's graduation party. So c congratulations, Peter. So thank you for providing the cake and all that. We're, and so anyway, it's going to be a great time. Let's kick off our summer on a, on a great note. Let's pray for good weather and uh, pray that we make connections with our, some of our friends in the neighborhood. All right, next. Blood Drive on the 25th of June. It's a Saturday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's a reminder, I haven't even signed up yet, so I'm going to get online and, and do that soon. But uh, be part of that. Thank you for all the volunteers that will be part of that great day. We've seen over the last two or three years now that uh, we see a lot of people from the neighborhood and making this part of their regular part of, of giving uh, blood. Anything else up there? Uh, yes. Pancakes in the parking lot, July 4th. Uh, we're still looking for some volunteers, so uh, Mike is the guy you talk to. He's there personally, or you could email him at mike at convergechurchomaha.org. This is also one of our big events of the year. We had a lot of people come out last year. Uh, we're praying for the same this year. The neighborhood is looking forward to it, and so uh, let's, uh, let's pray that God will be glorified and honored in all that. Anything else? Yes. Dylan Michael Hayes Memorial Scholarship. This has been going on for many, many years. If you're a full-time student and, um, and you want to apply for this and you're committed to Converge Church, uh, next week is the deadline to get this essay to me. And so just a reminder uh, for that. And I have a couple more on my list here. Uh, Wednesday at 6.30, uh, we'll have Family Transform Group down the hallway there. So keep that in mind. And then next Sunday, prayer gathering in the family room at 9.15, and then that will last for a half hour, and next Sunday we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper as well, so just be uh, prepared for that. All right, it's good to be here. I've got updates. Linda Boyle's procedure went well. She's pain-free. Uh, praise the Lord. Jean Gaberson has a new knee, and she's doing quite well. Coming home today, perhaps, Jim? Oh, praise the Lord. Jean is home. Good news. Uh, I saw a picture of Sierra Parr uh, that she is, she is up and walking in the hospital. She was on the pancreas transplant list, got the call, went to Minneapolis, went right into 12-hour surgery. Uh, this could be a game changer for this young woman who's had health issues her, her whole life. Our, we've been praying for her a long time, Diane and Bob, and we're going to pray that this is going to be a, a game changer uh, for, for her. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we, we look to you as our great God, um, as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We honor you we worship you. There's no one like you. There's, there's no one like you. There's no other gods. There's one true God, one true creator, um, and who gave his one and only son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead. So we love you. We praise you. We, we worship you. We also acknowledge that you are the great ph physician. Uh, Lord, you can heal uh, physically and we thank you for the success of Linda Boyle's procedure and Jean Gaber, uh, Gaberson's procedure and Sierra Parr's. Uh, we, uh, we pray for fast recovery. We especially lift up Sierra, Lord, this young lady that has struggled her whole life with serious, um, uh, dangerous uh, ailments. And so, Father, we pray uh, that this 
transplant will go well and that she'll be able to have a normal life and all honor and glory uh, goes to you, Father. Uh, Father, you're also the, the God of all encouragement and comfort and peace, and we pray, Lord, for your peace to, to rest on the Rielis family, upon the Strevey family, and upon the Hendrickson family who've lost loved ones recently, Lord. We, we thank you, Lord, for that the loved ones are in glory uh, with you, but on this side of heaven, we pray for a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that will guard our hearts and minds uh, in Christ Jesus. And, and so, Lord, strengthen uh, and, and give strong faith at this time, Father. We look beyond our walls, Lord, and we look to our city, we look to our nation, and, and uh, we get discouraged uh, when we think about what's going on around our country with all the, the division and the arguing and everything going on, Father. And we just pray that a great spiritual revival will take place in our nation, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will begin with the church and then begin with the hearts of people, Lord, and change them through the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, so we pray for a, just a spiritual revival renewal among ourselves here at Converge Church here at Omaha and throughout our country uh, as well, Father. We continue to pray for this situation down uh, in Texas of this mass shooting and uh, pray for comfort and peace as the, the funerals con continue for these uh, the children of the ones that were taken in this tragedy, Lord. We pray that somehow, some way, uh, that you would get honor and glory and that you would just bring tremendous peace uh, to, the, to the family members, Father. And speaking of families, Lord, we are a spiritual family here at Converse Church. We, we thank you for our community groups. We thank you, Lord, that we can do life together. And, uh, and so, Lord, as we do break into our groups, later on that uh, the gospel can be lived in compelling community and that we can encourage and love one another and grow together uh, in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we're in the summertime now and we got summertime events like um, uh, fr uh, family fun nights and, and so we just dedicate them to you, Lord, and uh, we do this for your honor and for your glory and may the gospel spread. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your word now. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Mike's preparation for today's message. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would anoint him with power now as he proclaims the word of God to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just uh, commend you uh, for the good news regarding the uh, Ananyev giving. Um, I asked our financial secretary. Uh, we've been trying to push that out a little bit wider than our own congregation, right? We've done a little bit of social media activity, and perhaps when that has popped up on your Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you've taken the opportunity to share that and push it a little bit farther to try to extend that beyond our, our congregation. And so we have, as was announced, uh, we met our goal. I asked our financial secretary, how much of that came from outside? How much of that came from outside of our congregation? A hundred dollars. So far. That means the remainder all raised from inside of our congregation. So, uh, yeah, I know you're, you're thanking the Lord with that, and, and I am too. And that just, uh, uh, like I said, I commend you and praise God uh, for that faithfulness and giving. That's a wonderful show of your heart. Today we're going to wrap up our last message in the Right Mind series. Uh, this has been sort of a, um, not a, not a cruise through Philippians begin to end, but landing at various points where the Apostle Paul talks about mental activity. So it's this idea of you should be thinking this way. You should understand life in this manner. This is the way you should interpret experiences. And, and you see these words sprinkled all the way through the book of Philippians or this letter that he wrote to the Philippian church. And so we've just been focusing our attention on those passages and, think, and asking ourselves, what is, what is the God's will for us in our intellectual life, how we perceive life? And, and fittingly, um, and we come to the end, the last one here in Philippians chapter 4, and it really seems to be right mind about, well, everything. How to have a right mind about everything as Paul writes 
about contentedness. Just as a little side note, uh, we'll start a series next week. As we wrap this up, next week we'll go to the Old Testament and look at lessons from the life of Abraham. All right, so look forward to that beginning next week. Um, I wanted to live off-grid before there even was a grid. Yeah, yeah, I'm that old. Um, but I, I, I really had this instinct as a kid that I wanted to, to live off grid. Uh, one of the first influences to that end was a book, My Side of the Mountain. Readers out there, you remember My Side of the Mountain? Yeah, you read that book and... Um, and that kind of just got inside of me. Sam is a young man, 12 years old, and he, he, he lives in a cramped space in, in New York with all of these relatives, and he decides to escape, right? So he runs away to the mountains, and uh, he learns how to be independent. He learns how to survive in the mountains all by himself in the woods, and uh, he he goes through his hardships, but he thrives with the help of his falcon. Okay, now let's check some memories. Do you remember what the falcon's name was? Bingo! Frightful was the name. That, wow, that's good memory. Frightful was the name of his falcon. And man, I just remember uh, when he found that that tree that had been struck by lightning and he figured out how to hollow that tree out. I was living that with Sam. I was just living that experience with Sam. A little bit later, I experienced the life and times of Grizzly Adams. Yeah, yeah, a little chuckle here and then. Grizzly Adams. Uh, Grizzly Adams. Uh, James Adams was a man who was falsely accused of murder, right? Kind of driven off into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he meets who? Not Frightful the Falcon. He meets Ben, not Fozzie, <laughs> good guess. Ben, uh, the bear, the grizzly bear, and uh, the two bond in the wilderness. And so you, you, you watch, in this case, movie followed by series. Um, all of the experiences of Grizzly Adams as he interacts with people who are coming through uh, the mountains and need his protection, uh, along with mad... Max, no, that's not a different movie, too. Uh, Mad Somebody and Old Number Seven, The Mule, right? And uh, they were independents. They lived life on their own terms. And as a young adolescent boy, boy, those things got into, got into my head. And uh, maybe there was already some sort of an inclination to that, but self-sufficiency, number one, and living life on your own terms... Seeing those things lived out in fiction really got deep into who I am. And, and, and I don't know, I, I'm confident I couldn't have ever expressed it at that age, but I really began to adopt a philosophy of living that said those two things have to be somehow components of a satisfied life. You have to be somehow independent so that you're not dependent on other people you're not dependent upon the whims of other people and whether they're performing the way you think they ought to. And, and then this idea uh, as well of living life on your terms. Not, not somebody else dictating how it's going to be to you, but living it on your own terms. In my adolescent head, these became important keys to the good life. What I didn't know is that those qualities have been considered keys to the good life for centuries, even millennia, in an organized philosophy of life. A recent New York Times article said this, modern, here's the word you're looking for to put a label on, stoicism. Modern stoicism has become an industry and a mega industry at that. For the consumers seeking wisdom on how to live the good life, and there are a lot of them, there are daily digests of Stoic quotations, books, websites packed with Stoic wisdom to kickstart your day, podcasts, broadcasts, online crash courses, and more. There's a resurgence of, uh, of attraction to this way of life that has been around for millennia, 
known as Stoicism. Now, I heard a Catholic bishop trying to explain, I think he might be on to something, trying to explain what the attraction of Stoicism is. Why are people turning to Stoicism in our day uh, to adopt a way of life? And he said this, um, religion as a life-directing path has given way. All right, we, we see that, right? People are turning away from religion and, and, and turned to science, materialism, right? However, science has nothing for the soul. Science has nothing for the soul. It's not deeply satisfying. It may, may provide answers to some that they feel are satisfying, but it doesn't do anything to nurture the soul. And so people having made the journey from religion to science are now moving on because they feel that stoicism offers a middle way. To some degree, it's empirical, it's scientific, it, do, it deals in reality with life, but it also does so in a way that touches the soul and gives people a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Now, founded 300 years before Christ, Stoicism is, it predates Jesus Christ by about 300 years. And it was developed, first of all, by the Greek philosopher Zeno. It's mainly associated today with ancient Romans. So maybe you've even heard these names. You've heard of uh, the emperor Marcus Aurelius, very famous for his stoic literature that he wrote, and the statesman Seneca. Stoicism stresses self-discipline to cultivate virtue and attainment of the elusive good life. Self-discipline produces virtue which allows you to deal with the ups and downs of life in a way that is ultimately satisfying. That's Stoicism. So uh, just a couple of famous lines from Stoics, uh, from Epictus. It's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them. Think about that a second. Now, I hope you're already starting to make a connection. We're going to contentment, right? contentment. Epictus says it's not things or circumstances that upset us. Uh, let me embellish a little bit. It's not the people around us. It's how we respond. It's not circumstances. It's how we interpret them or our opinions about them. It's not people. It's how we respond to them. See how that's related to contentment. Another one from Marcus Aurelius. The pain isn't due to the thing itself, but your estimate of it. It's the same kind of a thing. What they're saying is, yeah, we're all going to go through circumstances in life. Some of them are going to be glorious. Some of, some of them are going to be near hellish. What's, we, can't, we can't control that. What we can control is what's going on in the inner life. You see, now, I hope you're thinking, wow, yeah, that's, that's pretty pervasive. Uh, that's pretty pervasive in self-help books, certainly in this Stoic literature, but that sounds, well, nearly Christian. Nearly Christian, doesn't it? Turns out Paul was well acquainted with the Stoics. So you, you put this together. If the Stoics were 300 years before Christ and continued, then Paul was well familiar with it. You also know it if you're a student of the books of Acts, right? Because in the book of Acts, he sits down with a group. A famous for the Stoics is the porch, place where you discuss these things. And when Paul was in Athens, he talked with the Stoics. So this wasn't something foreign to him. He was immersed in Stoic thought. And so much so that, that many people believe that in Philippians chapter 4, he demonstrates his influence by the Stoics. That when he writes, I have learned in all things to be content, he's preaching something that he picked up from the Stoics. Now... That's an interesting concept. I'll let you debate that in your community group. Uh, whatever, the end product is that the Holy Spirit has put a stamp of approval on what Paul wrote. 
We'll have to do a little bit of thinking and comparing and contrasting to decide whether it's really Stoicism or whether there are unique and important distinctions. So keep that in mind, will you, as we go along. What we've got here in our last message in Right Mind is a beautiful paragraph at the end of his letter that is a thank you card. It's a thank you card. So I want you to literally imagine, um, we've been doing some cleaning out at the Friesen household and uh, found all kinds of old letters and memorabilia that's been kept. I want you to imagine this morning that you're digging through some old dusty boxes and you have found a thank you card. What's this? Why in the world did I keep it? This is a thank you card that has been written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi, and it contains the key to the good life. Whoa, okay, now I, oh man, I can't believe I filed this away. This should have been posted in my home all these years. I'm so glad I recovered it. I'm so glad that I did not throw this away. This is crucial. It's, it's, it's a thank you card. And, and to that end, it's, it's locked in history. It's very specific. But, whoa, there's something here that is absolutely profound. This is not a simple thank you card. This is a key. This is not something I say, oh, yeah, right, acknowledge the gift. Phew, chuck that. This is, whoa. Whoa. I will hang on to this forever. I want you to notice a couple things just before we get into the details. Notice that Paul clearly communicates gratitude. He's thanking them for a gift that they sent to him for his support. He clearly communicates gratitude. And the reason I need to say that is because when you look closely and you read it a few times, you also realize he never says thank you. He's dancing around something as he does this. He wants to communicate that he's not, un he doesn't want to offend these people, but at the same time, he can't quite bring himself to saying, oh, phew, I was so glad I got your gift. Thank you. It saved my life. He couldn't, you read it, you'll see it. He can't quite get there. And it's because of the theme of the paragraph. He says, my provision comes from the Lord. And I have learned to be content. So I want you to know I'm grateful, but I also want to communicate a lesson to you about what it means to live on the faithfulness of God. All right? He wants to maintain his self-sufficiency, or, or we would say dependence upon the Lord, without offending these donors. Let's get to it. Verse 10. He writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Or, or I realize now that, you know, we never broke up. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm realizing that now because this gift has arrived, but nevertheless you had no opportunity to express it. So I want to ask you, as you look at those simple words, look carefully, do your observation, what was Paul really thankful for? He got a gift. What does it say he was thankful for? Concern. Thank you, Joe. Exactly. Exactly. He was really thankful for, he got a gift, he got a check, it actually cashed, you know, it didn't bounce. He got what they intended, but what he got was so much more important to him. It was a revival of this connection between himself and the Philippians. There's important words here. He says, you have revived your concern for me. Let's take the word concern first. It's thoughtful love. It's a Greek compound word that is, is literally your thoughtful love. Now, that, that, that conveys a lot more to me than simply concern. Your thoughtful expression of love. And then the other word here, you have revived. We struggle with this one, um, but it's a flowery word. 
It, it literally here again, it's a word that means to blossom, that your thoughtful love has blossomed again. And the only reason I bring that out, revive will work, but he's using flowery words um, because he's gushing a little bit. He's gushing a little bit. This isn't a, you know, a logical thank you note. He's not printing in all caps. He's using cursive to express emotion here. Your, your thoughtful love has come through in this blossoming um, of your affection. That was a big deal to Paul, and, and here's what I want to draw. It was a big deal, and so what? So he rejoiced in the Lord greatly, all right? So here is the apostle Paul, and he's not going, great, got the gift, I'm going to keep working, deposited that, put it in the right column in the ledger, you'll get your little tax statement later in the year, blah, 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 we move on. No, he's going, wow, it's huge. People this, is, people, this is huge. My heart is soaring in the Lord because you have revived or your, your love has blossomed again in this way. Now, here's what I want to point out. Paul clearly longed for this close relationship that he demonstrated in this letter. He clearly longed. This was so important to him. He allowed himself to hope for this and what we're reading now is that the hope has been come to pass. That the hope has come to pass. And here's the important significant point. That means that that little scenario, as simple as it is, means that you can be content without me being emotionally detached. This is, this is huge, people. Uh, it may not seem so on a warm Sunday morning. It's huge. You can be content with your life without becoming emotionally detached from any outcomes. You can be content without being complacent. Be be becoming complacent. Complacent. <laughs> Contentment, in other words, is not a listless shrug at life. Now, it, we could easily fall into that. We could think, oh, well, now he's exhorting me. That preacher, he's probably right. I should be content. That seems right. Um, that seems like a virtue. And he's telling me to do it, so I'll try. And, and, and how do I do that? Well, I'll adapt this sort of affect in my life, towards life. I'll, I'll take on this persona where I just say, um, my, t my team didn't win the, N win the NBA final. I don't, I don't care. Um, I, didn't get a, I didn't get the raise I was hoping for. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you okay? Oh, I, no, I don't care. I don't care. You see what I'm saying? Contentment isn't an affect where you just sort of brush things off like you don't care one way or another. Contentment doesn't mean you can't have aspirations. Contentment doesn't mean that you can't have goals. Contentment doesn't mean that you long for one outcome and really disdain another outcome. It doesn't mean any of those things. So maybe we didn't understand what contentment meant at all, if that's true. You can have a strong emotional attachment to an outcome or an experience in life and still somehow be content. And I think that is absolutely critical. The Apostle Paul demonstrates this clearly in one other passage that he wrote. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and he was talking to slaves. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. And he writes to those slaves, each of you should remain in the condition in which he was called. This has troubled a lot of people. What in the world? How could the Apostle Paul write that to people who were household servants? Stay in the condition where you are. But then look at verse 21. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Ooh, he's writing that right along the line there, isn't he? Don't be concerned 
and understand that word deeply. Don't be concerned, but if you get the opportunity to change your position, by all means, you would consider that better. See there? So the Apostle Paul has lived in his advice exactly what he's describing in his thank you card for us here. Contentment is not a listless, shrug at life. If we think that, then we haven't quite got the secret of contentment yet. Don't squash your longings. Don't squash your goals, your aspirations, and say, this is how I'm being content. I don't really care anymore. It's not contentment. It's a hack. It's just a hack. Contentment is not being numb. Have I said that enough ways? Uh, so here's the question for us then, and I hope you'll take this up in the community groups. So what does it look like to contentedly aspire to, or what does it look like to contentedly strive for better health? Oh, shouldn't I just be going, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Let's quote Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does it look like to contentedly strive for, make plans for, discipline yourself for better health? What does it look like to contentedly work to get a job promotion? Put them together, you know? Everything you've got to get the promotion, but do it contentedly. How do you, how do you put those together? Apparently, it's possible. How about financial security? Can you say, I am content with the lot that God has given me, and at the same time, I want to take advantage of every opportunity that I can to create financial security? Can you do both of those? I suggest that somehow you can if you understand the secret of contentment. Let me throw one else, uh, because I want to test you. Can you do it for beauty? Could you aspire to greater, just because, again, I want to test you, could you aspire to greater attractiveness personally and do it with contentment? Oh, you guys noodle over that. Give me your answers. So Paul writes, thanks for the gift. Well, he doesn't exactly, as I've told you, but thanks for the gift. And then in verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Contentment is a learned ability. Paul models that here. He describes it here. It's a learned ability to navigate the ups and downs of life. We can do more here, but let's use that to, as a beginning point. It's something that I can cultivate and get better and better and better at. And so, as I said, as we were in our worship time, this is something that you put up there as, oh, as I grow more mature in Jesus Christ, I should expect that I have greater and greater contentment in my life. This is one of those things that I can see. Am I growing? I can ask myself, and I can ask God, am I, am I growing? He's going to point you towards contentment. Are you experiencing greater contentment in your life? I read a story about a Jewish man in Hungary uh, who went complaining to his rabbi. And he says to his rabbi, ah, oh, life is unbearable. I can't take it anymore. Nine of us, there's nine of us living in one room. And I just can't stand life anymore. We can't go on this way. What am I supposed to do? And the rabbi answered, well, here's my recommendation. Take your goat into the room with you. Uh, pardon me? Pardon me? Take, uh, yeah. Take the, bring the goat in. Have the goat live with the nine of you. Well, he trusted his rabbi, so he went home and, and he took the goat with him. And uh, they lived that way for about a week. And the, and the week later, the man came back and he's more distraught than ever. And he says, oh, my word. Uh, this is, you know, I thought it was bad before. This has absolutely got to end. 
It stops right here. There's got to be some resolution. The rabbi said, yeah, good idea. Go home and let the goat out and then come back in another week. So the man went home and he kicked the goat out of his house and he came back in a, week, a week later and he said, life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Just the nine of us. Just the nine of us living in that room. It is so peaceful having just the nine of us in the home. Oh, my. Uh, it's a fun story, but listen, think about it. It suggests that the key to contentment is to know that both pleasure and pain are relative. Right? It suggests that the way to get, find contentment or to be at peace with something is to know that it could be worse or that it could be better. And you know what? I hear that a lot. I think we rehearse that theme as Christians. Um, in, in fact, it's almost a mark of, of godliness. We say, you know, I, I can say, wow, I, I, I was sick this last week. I had, I had 24 hours of fever, and I was, and you'll sympathize with me. You'll sympathize with me immediately, because you're good people, you're loving people, and you'll say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. What a bummer. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll come back because I'm godly and I'll say, yeah, but there's lots of others who have it so, so much worse, right? You know, and I'll acknowledge world somehow that there's some plague somewhere. Oh, it's nothing. So, other people have it so much worse. As if the key to contentedness was just relative. I, I, it could be worse. So I'll take some satisfaction in that I'm, I'm not at that end of the scale. Now, that might work. That might work to a degree, but I'm not sure that it's at the essence of contentment. Contrast that thought to Paul in these verses in 11 and 12. Paul says, I have learned. It's something that goes on inside of him. I have learned to be content. It's a skill you can learn. Um, it's something that you develop and you can practice at. Um, I, was, I had a wonderful experience this week. Um, kids had given me a, a gift for my 60th birthday of uh, being able to go soaring, gliding, you know. And uh, so pulled up behind an airplane, pull the rope, see that thing twang off, and there you are left in the air in this airplane, right? And I uh, got the privilege, because I have a little bit of experience, of trying to fly that, fly that glider. And uh, coach sitting behind me, jabbering the whole time. Do this, do this, do this. This is not a coordinated turn. Watch your yaw, you know. Step on that yarn. You know, all of these, this pilot uh, phraseology running through my head. I'm not even enjoying it anymore, because now I'm pressure, right? But, but all, for all of the coaching, we got down, and he said, now listen... Remember, this is a skill. I understand. I'm talking a lot. I'm coaching you. But you can't learn it through instruction. You can only learn it through doing it. You'll get better and better and better. So here, same way about contentment. And I want you to take this to heart. You learn it by doing it and doing it and doing it. You might understand. You might walk out of here and be able to ace the quiz. It doesn't mean that you're good at it yet. I might be able to ace the quiz about gliding, answer, you know, fill all the blanks in right, but I would not want to be sent up alone yet, right? Uh, same way with contentment. It's a skill to be developed. You young people, work at it early. Work at it early so that you have years of practice. No matter where you are in life, uh, in fact, older people, would you please do this? I want to encourage all of you. Uh, morning and evening, one of your primary missions, is you wake up in the morning and your first conversation is with the Lord, I hope. You know, first thoughts, Lord, and you're thinking, help me be content today. Lord, I, I want to embrace this day knowing that you are enough. Will you, will you help me be content? And at the end of the day, I want you to think, was I content today? This is, you know, this is life-altering, life-altering, because you're reminding yourself of who you are, and we'll get to this in a minute, in Jesus Christ. So, help me be content. 
Bless me with contentment. Was I content? And every day, you're putting yourself in a place, in a relationship with God that's going to bring satisfaction in life. Absolutely critical to your experience of the good life is contentment. Make it, a, make it a regular habit. So Paul says, I've learned to be content. Secondly, then he says, I know how. I have learned process. Secondly, I know how to be brought low to abound. Now, something is uh, begging to be supplied there, in my opinion. Um, we all abound and are brought low whether we learn the lessons or not, right? We get slapped around a little bit by life. I think he's, he's using a little bit of a shorthand. He's saying, uh, in the least possible words, I've learned how to do good and I've learned how to do bad well. We could say it that, you know, as simply as that. I, I, I found how to do each of those well. But maybe even better than that, I think maybe he's saying, I've learned how or I know how to be brought low and still be satisfied with God's grace. I know how to be brought low and still be content with God's grace. And on the other hand, I've learned how to rise high and remain foundationally sustained by God's grace. It's the same either way. There's a fixed point on my horizon. It's God's grace. So I go up and I go down based upon the circumstances of life that I can't control. And yet, whether I'm up, whether I'm down, it's God's grace that gives me this ability to be humble. Finally, he says, Paul says, I have learned the secret. See this progression in just these two verses? I have learned. Secondly, the result is I now know how. And then thirdly, I have learned the secret. Um, this is a special word here again. It means to be thoroughly uh, initiated, thoroughly initiated into the mystery. This is like being part of a club. I have been thoroughly initiated into the mystery of living above my circumstances. You want to be there? You want to be in that club with the Apostle Paul? need to be part of your regular routine that you center yourself in Jesus Christ. So contentment is a developed skill, it is an understanding, and it is a key. That whole idea, I've been, I've been initiated. It is a key to satisfaction in life. But something's still missing. Despite all that we have so far, and I hope it's helpful, there's something still missing, and it's power. Uh, we got a great machine here with which we can be uh, content in life. We can achieve satisfaction. We can experience what we might call the good life. We've got all the machinery in place, but there's no power yet. And so he goes on and in verse 13 writes what is pro probably the most used words in all of Philippians. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now that's used in, you know, all kinds of circumstances, right? And you kind of shake your head and go, oh, I'm not sure Paul meant that. Um, but here's the context. It has to do with contentment. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Contentment is an infused power to master them. That is those circumstances. Contentment is a learned ability to navigate the ups and downs in life. Contentment is an infused power to master them. Now, for the Stoics, ability to master circumstances comes from personal discipline. So in Stoic philosophy, a young man is training himself to be impervious to all of the ups and downs in life. So I don't ever want to be in a situation where I'm making bad, bad decisions because I'm too cold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the snow barefoot. So when the time comes and I'm trapped in a snowstorm, no big deal. Been there. Done it all my life. This is what a Stoic does. I, I don't want to be in a situation um, where I'm, I'm thrown off my groove because I'm hungry. So I intentionally won't eat. So that when I get into circumstances where I can't eat, no, Ben, Dale, ben here, done that, it's not an issue. So a Stoic is always practicing him, these things in order to be prepared for a circumstance that he can't control. 
And again, there might be some use to that. Um, there might be some point in doing that. Go ahead, take your cold shower. I, <laughs> I don't know. Do what you can to prepare yourself for the hardships of life. That'll take you about so far. Even the apostle wrote, I discipline my body and make it my slave, didn't he? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I discipline my body, I make it my slave. Was he influenced by the Stoics? Is that okay? Uh, get out and walk, people, all right? Do what you need to do uh, to prepare yourself for life. But discipline is only the means of appropriating the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. All right? What he writes here in verse 13 is that he can only achieve that contentment finally. He can hack it. All of us can hack it by saying it didn't matter that much to me. But he says, you want to find true contentment and still have the strongest desires of any person in the world? Then you got to have power. And that power is union with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think two, way of talking, two ways of talking about the same thing. Union with Jesus Christ or filling of the Holy Spirit. Having that power within you to work the sanctifying um, discipline of Jesus Christ. Conscious of the joy of the Lord flowing through all of the ups and downs of life, you will know contentment. When you are conscious of the joy of the Lord whether you're soaring or plowing a rut in life, when in either kind of circumstance, you're aware, hey, my joy in the Lord is still untouched. When I'm grieving over a loss or high-fiving with my family, if I still note, I can still hear the melody, it's the joy of the Lord then you know you have started to master contentment in your life. So you can safely aspire to what your heart desires by cultivating a subtle disposition that God's gifts are satisfying, God's consolation is sufficient in dependence upon the life of Christ in you. Stoicism, we got to wrap up. Stoicism and Christianity have many parallel paths. Both put a high priority on the inner life. Both encourage discipline. Both value the cultivation of virtue, especially temperance regarding inner turmoil, courage regarding external temporal. That's valid in both. Both recognize that whatever happens is, in some sense, the will of God. You'll have to nuance that one out too. Whatever happens in life is in some sense the will of God. But only a thoroughly Christian revelation provides, number one, a promise that God will never ever leave you or forsake you. Secondly, a promise that he will work all things together for good. So that even if the circumstance is bad and there's no other label you can put on it, he will stir it into a pot and the outcome will be good. Promise to be with you, a promise to work it out, and thirdly, a promise to replace every tear with eternal joy. Stoicism has a lot to commend it, but it's far below far below the revelation that we have in Jesus Christ. And I would commend the life and the adventure of committing yourself to following the Lord as the ultimate way to experience the good life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I guess it would do well right at this moment to pray what we know as the serenity of prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Maybe we could tag onto it a little bit, and contentment to live your peace throughout all of those circumstances. Heavenly Father, contentment may be one of the brightest lights of personal witness in our society today because there's a tremendous lack of it. 
And so I simply pray on behalf of all of us and all of us together pray that you will light us up in that sense, in the modeling of contentment through all life has to offer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Uh, thank you to everyone that's online, is about ready to sign off. Um, contentment uh, begins with a union with Jesus Christ, um, a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. If you have questions about that or want to have a conversation about what it means to know Christ as Lord and Savior, you can talk to me afterwards or talk to Pastor Mike uh, afterwards as well. Uh, we all have different stories, different scenarios, but the, the promise is true that we can be content in all circumstances because of, of his strength in us. And so if you have any questions about that, uh, uh, you could jot that down maybe on one of the connecting cards in front of you and put it in one of the offering boxes out there. Uh, we encourage conversations after this. Uh, also, if you want to be on our email list, go ahead and put that on the connecting card uh, as well. Any prayer requests as well, either to the pastors or the elders or to the church, go ahead and indicate uh, that. Uh, so glad you're here. Uh, let's close this time with worship. <laughs>